All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today with the Trusted Sec webinar on adding value to a traditional pen test. My name is Stephen Marshowitz, Director of Program Development here at Trusted Sec. And we're always looking to bring relevant content to you. And this webinar really came about because we had so many clients inquiring about other ways they could both strategize and tactically improve their programs. Before we get with that, a few housekeeping items. Uh, definitely this webinar will be recorded so you can go back and look at it on our YouTube page or with links on our events page. And we absolutely encourage you to ask questions in the Q and area, Q and A area along the way. And we'll make sure we get to them either during the presentation or at the end of it. A quick little blurb on Trusted Sec. Um, in looking across the full life cycle of your program, Trusted Sec can help with building, with risk, program and compliance reviews and readiness, testing. This is not only penetration testing, which we'll talk a lot about today, but the customized training as well, testing as well with our latest being cloud testing. If you haven't checked out that webinar, it's a, it's a great one. Fixing the remediation of those issues with various security solutions and automation. And finally, we also help with responding to any incident that your organization has. Some of the major differences about us is we have such a large number of senior consultants and, and really the amount of true leaders among them, industry leaders among them is unreal. Uh, you not only get the skills and experience of these folks, but they're also strengthened by the research and innovations teams that we have for both technical and advisory services. So this investment in non-billable people, along with the information sharing culture, is really simply incredible that we have. And, and when you do an, an engagement with us, you'll definitely see that come across. Every person you meet is, is really truly better than the next. And speaking of better than the next, we have a great panel for you today, uh, Alex, Phil, and Shane. Uh, Alex, you almost need no introduction now, but uh, would you start giving us off a little bit of background about yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my name is Alex Hirthdon. I'm the Advisory Solutions Director here at Trusted Sec. I've been with the company about nine years now um, and work with organizations of all sizes and all verticals to help... Uh, really assess and help build out information security programs and, and work to understand issues and, and increase maturity of security programs over time. Phil? Yeah, so uh, Phil Rowland, I've been here ooh, a little over two years now. Um, I head up or I'm the practice lead for the remediation team. And we um, focus a lot on configuration reviews that we'll talk about later and then um, also, the, the whole uh, fixing part of the, the previous slide is, is really what our team focuses on, so, so resolving those issues and findings from other, other practices. Shane. And I'm Shane Hartman. I have over you know, 20 years of computer technology experience uh, in networking, perimeter security, forensics, and, and incident response. I'm the guy you call when everything's starting to go wrong and then help get it back to normal. Excellent. So as we get started today, we want to start off with this, uh, this little quote. And if, if your only tool is a hammer, it's really hard to eat spaghetti. This is kind of the theme uh, for what we see in many, many organizations uh, when they're looking at penetration testing. A lot of them really see that as the only tool they use for advice and improvement in their program. And there's several other things that you know, definitely can come into play in this regard. And in that same moment or whatever, it seems like uh, from the IR point of view that many places that we go to, they buy many, many tools and they find that they've just bought a lot of hammers. They haven't bought a lot of other things that actually make it go together successfully. Yeah, sometimes you need a screwdriver. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> it's great. As you probably know, um, you know, penetration testing, Trusted Sec is a global leader in tech intelligence around that. Um, again, many people who call in are looking for this expert expertise. It's still our most popular service. Um, you know, most organizations have something to do with us in, in that regard. Um, and it is an opportunity for a great outside in perspective. 
Um, but many organizations really overlook some of the value there is to be gained about um, ab about some of the strategic as well as the tactical findings within it. Typical findings are tactical within the penetration test, um, but the strategic findings, um, you know, you're going to see even even with those within the penetration test, the uh, audit your passwords, patch the system. Um, you know, that type of thing. And, and hopefully you're improving some monitoring detection. But there are different types, of course, and we'll help you navigate uh, that future. And obviously you have to have a, a penetration test, you know, but, you know, for control validation, et cetera. Um, but there are gaps and it really isn't a program building area. And so just to pause for a second on the poll shows that um, Really, forty-two percent. Most most organizations uh, see themselves as a three or four. Uh, so, really, uh, that's a that's a great improvement some, from some of the the past ones that we've seen. And and definitely, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of improvement and definitely maturing of those programs. I know Alex uh, handles a lot of those types of areas. Alex, what have you been kind of seeing in this in this regard? So it's really fascinating. You know, I, I think 15 years ago or, or so, and, you know, somebody was out doing an assessment, uh, kind of the joke was that you could just about write the report on the plane ride out to the client because you had a pretty good idea what you were going to find. Right. Um, and, and over time, organizations have certainly focused on maturing and have improved many things. Of course, the threat environment is, has changed as well. Uh, but we certainly are seeing, um, you know, organizations focused more on overall maturity and not just controls being in place. Um, one of the things that, that we look at um, is not just control existence, but control effectiveness, which is something that a, a pen test, of course, can be extremely helpful with. Um, you know, to the point earlier, it, it's, um, you know, also understanding why certain findings, you know, either are there now or, or continue to show up over time. And if you liken it to, you know, something in the, the medical field, you know, if somebody has high blood pressure, it's one thing to let them know that, but it's a very different thing to look at the causes um, and also give them, you know, good recommendations for, you know, how to um, mitigate that issue. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and this is one one slide. Um, this, this is from an RFP that we, we received. And really, I put it in there to show just the overwhelm of things. And, and, and you know, when you look at these, it's it's kind of crazy in that um, some are tools, some are exploits, some are attacks, some are concepts, and some are services. But we see so many things happening. And again, when you're looking at one tool, it's very difficult to get a handle on it. It's unbelievably complex. Um, you know, just in my 15 years, it's been such a different landscape now than it was then. Um, and, and we really, you know, want to make sure that we are looking at the various aspects of our programs. And Alex, as we discussed, you're in a lot of intro calls. So with people who are calling in for pen tests, that type of thing, how are how are they making decisions without really, you know, and, and how are you helping them really when they call in for and they have just a specific need or they know they have to get a pen test because of a regulation or something? How are you kind of just starting off guiding them? So like many other things in information security, um, you know, we have a lot of, you know, issues with certain terms being used to mean many different things, right? And so when someone says penetration test, um, you know, oftentimes they really mean everything from a vulnerability scan all the way up to, you know, what we think is kind of a full on red team type activity. And so for us, it, it's really understanding why do you want a pen test? You know, what are you hoping is an outcome? Um, you know, it, it's oftentimes people will have to do them for compliance reasons or, um, you know, their their customers will be asking if they have one, et cetera. Um, and so for us, it's really understanding that. And if someone's interested in the pen test because they want to increase their maturity as well, then there are other things, of course, that we'll want to look at and really understanding, you know, what the, the findings are and, and making sure that they understand that, you know, the pen test is obviously a scoped activity. And so it's going to depend on, you know, the amount of time uh, that's given to it and, uh, you know, targets and, and things like that. But for us, we're always looking for, you know, ways to close the findings, but also look for the root cause. Uh, you know, one of the things that's most frustrating um, as a consultant is when you see an organization that has the same issues year over year. And from a business perspective, you can certainly earn a pretty good living, you know, just kind of pen testing every year and, and having the same organization have the, the same issues. But for us, that's not why we do it, right? I mean, the goal is to help organizations become more mature. So especially if you're talking to an organization that's, that's seeing the same issues 
you know, test after test is really getting into it and understanding why those findings are there and what are the challenges at the organization um, that are preventing them from being able to uh, remediate that. So this is pretty interesting. If you see the poll that just came across, um, we see that in these operational gaps, uh, it's pretty well distributed. Uh, it's 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 fascinating that we see so many different uh, aspects of challenges and gaps in our programs, especially since uh, just the previous poll was you know most people are view themselves as three or fours in maturity, which is uh, which is really, really interesting um, that there's so such a widespread aspect in here. I, I guess secure software development is, and we'll be talking about that today is is the is the leader in this, uh, followed by automation. so and and incident per, per, uh, preparedness after that. So so that's really fascinating. Um, Alex, when you see, you know, talking to the CS, CISOs and and organizations just in general, um, how are you really getting them in a defensible position, communicating, you know, that type of thing through something like a risk assessment? So it really does, I think everything that we do comes down to risk, right? And it's something that that's talked about a lot. And, um, you know, information security is we've had conversations about risk for years and years and um, have continued to kind of get those things dialed in more. But, you know, one of the things I've heard you say, Steve, is that, you know, there's really a million things from a control perspective that any organization could be doing. But what are the most impactful, right? We don't have unlimited time, unlimited budget. And so really understanding the actual risk um, that's there and, and making sure that controls buy down those risks in appreciable ways and measurable ways, um, because that's the key. Um, because really um, being able to prioritize, you know, what we're fixing and remediating and, and looking at is what's most important. Um, you know, understanding, um, you know, where your data is and, you know, how systems are connected, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can actually understand what the results of that you know test are going to to mean from an overall organizational perspective and you know what the losses could be etc you know it used to be that you know you'd able to show a pen test result to an exec and say hey look you know these guys were able to break in we need more money or you know right now this is this is how vulnerable how vulnerable we are but but it hasn't you know worked out that way for probably several years and, and they're using these risk assessments now to, you know, one, one of the challenges we have in security as security people is we hold all the risk and we don't really easily transfer it back to the people who make those decisions, the CFO, et cetera. So one of the things I do like about these risk assessments is it says, okay, you know, you're the CFO, you have all the budget, here's all of our problems, here's how much money you're giving me to fix them and people and so forth. What do you want to do? Do you want to accept the risk or do you want to, to do, you know, want me to do more about it through budgeting and, and staffing and, and so forth? And it really does put that back onto the, the powers that be the other executives. Because again, you know, when, when you're holding the risk, basically any problem that goes wrong in your organization, the first thing I'm going to say is, well, why didn't you fix it? Well, no one ever goes back and says, you know, well, you know, how, I didn't fix it because I didn't have enough money. Well, if you didn't have money, why didn't you tell me? Like I did tell you, and it's this whole roundabout. So when you do a risk assessment, one of the things that I really do love about it is it gets that it gets the executives involved and it gets that risk to some degree off of you and onto them making decisions based on this kind of information. And Alex, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you're doing around compliance and control validation, you know, really with the pen test, but, but all around. So for us, it's interesting because on program assessments and other types of um, kind of broader based assessments, you know, there's always a degree of, you know, how much control validation any organization is really looking for. And it, again, it comes down to kind of that uh, two pieces of kind of the maturity score being existence and effectiveness. And from a control perspective, you know, showing existence is fairly straightforward, um, you know, for anybody that works in audit, I'm, I'm sure they're maybe rolling their eyes a little bit, because we all know of situations where it can be tough to uh, kind of really get into um, some of the existence based on, you know, how controls use used and, um, and documented everything else. But the effectiveness can be much tougher, right? It's much tougher to know that if that control is, is in place, is it really doing what it's supposed to? 
And so for us, it really does tie back to that risk assessment um, and understanding, you know, the entire organization and its systems and data and how things are accessed and kind of move around and shared externally and, and on and on and on to really understand if that control is, you know, doing what it's intended to do. I would, I would say that probably in addition to, you know, effectiveness being uh, super important, and that's one thing that the, a pen test definitely can, can get to is, you know, are the overall controls effective at, you know, whatever the pen test was targeting, whether it be, you know, endpoint security or, or whatever. Um, but the, the existence is also, like you mentioned, can sometimes be difficult to ascertain. And a lot of that comes down to just the complexities of how we manage systems these days how um, hands-off IT is. We, we now set you know, endpoint policies and we, we set all these really high level um, arbitrary policies to apply to things. And, and it's really difficult to tease out, you know, are we actually protecting all of the things that we care about or are there gaps in that? Um, and so that's something that sometimes a pen test can get at, but, but oftentimes uh, that's a, you know, that would be a really inefficient way to find all of your, you know, all of your endpoints that don't have the firewall disabled, for instance. Um, so, so, you know, having, having that control validation at each specific control and being able to look at your configurations and know for sure that you're doing it correctly um, can be super helpful. And Alex, you, you really have uh, spearheaded that here at TrustedSec with, you know, getting the control validation. So not just saying, hey, we're this much mature, but, but validating it. And again, with the pen tests, you know, that are, are you mapping those results to it? Are you using other tools? How, how are you going about that? Just in obviously reviewing documentation, maybe. But but how, what other ways are you kind of you know doing the control va validation for those more mature organizations or those ones that are really saying, hey, I, I, great that you said that or we said this. You know, I really want you to show me exactly what where we are. So to that end, it really depends on the organization and the type of assessment. Um, you know, one of the things that we've really been focusing on here is kind of using multiple services and multiple assessment types to kind of paint a full picture. And, you know, a pen test, you know, isn't necessarily going to give you insight into, you know, what your user policy looks like or, you know, even your incident response, if that's not kind of included in the, the whole thing and et cetera. Um, and, and so for us, it's when we're validating controls, it really is a series of, you know, talking through, uh, you know, the consumers of the, the security controls, understanding how they're using them, looking at the documentation, um, you know, looking at settings, um, and then kind of in, in towards the end, if we're combining it with the technical assessment, is actually testing that control, um, you know, through our other assessment types. We obviously saw this a lot with PCI there, you know, but now it, it has really, you know, sort of expanded into some of the other um, standards and, and regulations. And I think one thing that's important also when you're looking at control validation and how we're documenting that type of assessment is, you know, when organizations are using these assessments to satisfy third party requirements or insurance requirements or, or whatever that is. They really are looking for the evidence, um, you know, the, the assessment field has really changed in that way. And for us, it's even if a, a report, um, you know, may have an executive summary that's, um, you know, fairly short, the appendix is always going to have all that, you know, evidence that was gathered and what was looked at and when and um, et cetera, et cetera, from more of a, an audit type perspective. So what are you doing with helping organizations planning and, and road mapping then? So from there, you know, again, I think one of the, the things that, you, you know, you hear most from organizations is uh, you're, what they're most pleased with is helping to prioritize. Because again, if, if you're looking at, um, especially if you're, if you're Greenfield, but looking at a program, you know, how do you know what is good enough? And how do you know what you should be doing and, and what's going to be most impactful? And being able to really, um, you know, prioritize those things based on maturity. You know, a lot of organizations, if they're using, a, you know, a scale for maturity, uh, one of the most interesting things that you'll see, especially, um, you know, with, with people that work in IT, um, oftentimes like to be argumentative and we're perfectionists and, and things like that, is they may be wondering, um, you know, why aren't we a five on a scale of five or, or even a four? But for a lot of organizations, uh, that doesn't make sense, right? You know, being a three is good enough, you know, being a three based on risk and based on business realities um, and budgets and, and everything else um, is, is fine. And so for us, it really is understanding the organization and, and how it's using data. Um, you know, it, it's the number of companies that you talk to that are very willing to take on risk 
because it's how they've been able to grow the company and, and um, et cetera. But if you understand that, then you can help them prioritize their program and prioritize initiatives and controls and everything else. And then, you know, have milestones in place um, and goals to get there and ways to kind of constantly assess the progress of the program, the increased maturity and in, in, in how it's functioning and really put that into action. And on that same front or whatever, like the, even the slide points out, it creates like a feedback loop. So from the IR point of view, we, we discover things as we go along. We may be focused on a specific uh, threat actor that's in and doing what they're doing what they're doing. From that, we end up deriving other information about the, the internal workings of the network, compliance and controls, uh, operations and how they work. And those become recommendations that can be fed back up for them to continue to, to mature. Or in some cases, we may even toss it back over and say, we'd recommend that you do a pen test in order to, to flush this out a little bit better. Great. So Phil, take us through this a little bit. Obviously, you know, when we do pen tests, it's, you know, ransomware is, is such a huge topic. Um, seeing a lot of the conferences, even though it's generally not, you know, a, a specific presentation, but it's really weaved throughout and it's changed so much of our industry just in the last couple of years. Um, when they're doing their pen tests and they're and they're trying to get to the backups, um, you know, where does that how, how far can that extend and and what other types of things do you know do they really need to be looking at? Yeah, so on, I mean, on the backup front, really, the, the biggest risk to, to an org is is like the loss of all of your data, and I don't mean like theft of your data. I mean like you can't operate your business because all of your data in the systems are offline, and that's really the the risk that ransomware poses. Um, and then the, the big question is how quickly can you get back to operation? Um, so, so having a review of your backup structure as far as, you know, can you actually get your backups um, back to a working state, like restore your systems back from a working state. And a pen test is gonna be really, unless you really targetedly had a scope where you wanted a pen test of your backup infrastructure, it's probably not something they're gonna, they're gonna focus on. Um, or, or at least they're not gonna get to that stage of the attack until the very end. And that's assuming they get to that and, and aren't just like busy enumerating all of the other problems they find. So the, something a little bit more targeted to look at your backup infrastructure and to find those dependencies, to find those uh, bits of your backup architecture that are most important to secure so that when or if the worst happens, you can get that stuff back. Um, the, one of the biggest things that we see as gaps in this space are those dependencies. So things like the passwords to your um, completely segmented backup system are in your production key management vault and that's on a production server. Or all of, all of your documentation for your backup is on your you know, production SharePoint page or something like that. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we, we see. And then we look a little bit deeper and, and want to understand also um, how those things are configured. You know, are the systems themselves hardened against things? And that we can do from a configuration standpoint. And, and um, it, gives you, it gives an organization a much better understanding of just the whole architecture of their backups. In that same vein, from the IR point of view, because we deal with ransomware on a pretty regular basis, uh, we've noted that the backups is one of their primary things that they go for. They do go for it close to the end, as was already pointed out. Um, they are very aware of the backup type technologies that are in place, especially things like Veeam. They know how it works. They know how to either exploit it or they, they escalate privileges enough to get in. And then they either delete them, take them offline, or, or make them so that they're completely inaccessible. This puts the company in a in a in a position where they they're not really sure what to do um, because they don't know the recovery process at that point, and it gets into disaster recovery. But when we do note those and they haven't gotten to it or they're they're able to recover, um, part of our recommendations are those things that make sure that that's in a secure enclave that they they don't have a cons uh, the same passwords posted somewhere else or using even the administrators 
are kind of should have limited access to it so that they they can't get into it with that particular account that they have to have a special account in order to be able to even get into it um, just keeps that um, enclave there separated from the rest of it so that when they're running their tools or whatever that they're using that they're not actually able to get to the backups and either encrypt them or take them offline delete them or any of the number of things that we have seen over the years. And one of the things here, you know, is just, you know, sharing some of the stories of just even yesterday, having an organization that gets a pen test regularly, because of course you have to, but seeing those same findings over and over. What types of things and, and you know, what's become more popular or, you know, in some ways um, fill of, of really hardening and, and looking at some of the, you know, different areas where either pen test gets to, but, you know, it can't get into some of the, you know, some of the more nitty gritty details of it. And so those findings keep popping up. Yeah, I mean, fixing stuff is is a hard challenge, right? So the remediation side of the problem is time consuming slash expensive, you know, read that how you will. Um, and, and it's an ongoing thing, right? So we, we fix it today, but tomorrow we add more devices. So, so we have to make sure that the ways that we fix these problems will persist into the future. That's, that's I think, the biggest challenge that most um, legacy IT organizations, as far as operations go, are, are struggling with. It's just, how do we fix this in a way that we don't ever have to look at it again? Um, and, and to speak to your point about the, the recent um, conversation is, you know, a, a client that's had these repeat findings, um, and it's because they were fixing the finding and not the reason why the finding is there. Uh, and so we see this in all environments, right? So it, it happens in Active Directory on-prem, it happens in Active Directory in the cloud with Azure, it happens in cloud environments themselves, and we're seeing it happen a lot in cloud environments, partially because of something we'll talk about later, but um, just because of the nature of the fact that it's not just IT standing up resources now. Um, so one of the things that can help is a, is a policy-based look or framework-based look at how we're actually implementing our hardening around all of these different resources. Um, so you know, meeting a standard and then making sure that we're internally building a process that we're constantly working towards that standard. So rather than looking at remediation of like, we need to fix finding 1.3.7, let's look at identity and make sure that we've got a good hardening platform around identity. And we, we really understand what we're, what our goals are for hardening those systems. You know, that, that hygiene is so important and what kind of things have you seen as have you been seeing um, as more people have moved from on-prem to the cloud or still have a hybrid are there differences in that because this you know this hardening and um, and config reviews has, has really picked up steam a lot particularly yeah. on the cloud yeah and so that some of the challenges with the cloud um, one is is sort of the level of control that you have over the infrastructure so legacy hardware, legacy, you know, local cloud, hypervisor type um, local systems, you have, you have essentially full control over the, the platform itself. And so you can deploy whatever tool you need to gain visibility into that. One of the things with the cloud is you're kind of beholden to the tools that they present you um, to use, or you've got to go get something that ties into their API. Um, to see the, how things are configured behind the scenes. And so that's that's one challenge is just understanding the new way that things get configured in, in cloud resources. Um, and then the second big piece of the visibility side of that is, is how these things all talk to each other. Um, it's, it's it, again, it, it's kind of the DevSecOps thing that we'll talk about in a little bit, but these resources have access to things in ways that we didn't consider previously. And so understanding what they have access to, the data that they have access to, and what things have access to them uh, is one of the uh, big challenges that we've seen people not really fully understanding or appreciating. Um, and some, some examples from history are things like S3 bucket metadata that's that's out there and you can you can see information about things um, that really we thought should have been private but weren't 
Um, so it's those sorts of, of behaviors that we just don't really fully understand uh, or clients don't really fully understand. And coming from the IR perspective, the cloud presents a whole nother set of challenges when it comes to just the logging, what the log formats look like and what's contained in them. Um, like the Office 365 up there, depending on what license level you have, the the how long the logs go back or how much the retention is because you're you're beholden to what your service is uh, can be shortened usually 90 days. Um, some of the other things that are in there, you know, with Azure and Active Directory, you don't know necessarily all that you have available to you until you start digging into it. Um, if you have, say, Active Directory on-prem, there's no unified audit log. That's something that's completely cloud type of environment. Until you know how to look at those things, it's kind of harder to triage and figure out what's going on on your system. Yeah, and, and to that point too, with especially with logging, if you don't do it ahead of time, it's too late, right? So on the IR side, um, if, if you haven't gone through like a config review to find all of the different logs and alerts that need to be configured and, and you know, validate that those are in fact sending events to somewhere that you can inspect later, you know, then you, you call Shane's team and they just have to kind of say, well, you know, too bad. We don't know. So, and that has happened. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> So a couple questions um, that on cloud pen testing versus this cloud config reviews, where do you see each fitting in? You know, where should you start? Um, oh, more? yeah. Um, so we, we generally recommend that you start with a config review, right? So for, for things like AWS, GCP, um, Azure, so the subscription side of Azure where you're deploying resources, um, when you're pen testing those, the scope is fairly limited. Like they don't, they don't really want you to pen test Microsoft's infrastructure. They want you to pen test the stuff that you've deployed to Microsoft's infrastructure. Um, and so because of that, if you start with a config review, you get a much more, first of all, it's more efficient because we can look at everything and not just like what we have time to look at because it's, it's the, the assessment of that can be automated to a certain extent. Um, and then, and then the second thing is we can look at everything. We can even look at things that are buried behind the firewall. We can look at things that are, you know, maybe just more operationally um, consistent. So thing, you know, do you have backups or some ability to recover key vaults because all of your secrets are in your key vault. Uh, so those sorts of things, a pen test wouldn't necessarily be able to understand. And it's kind of a foundational operational maturity and security uh, kind of thing. And so we would, you know, as part of the config review, that's something that we can look at ahead of time. And then once you know you've done those basics from a hardening and from a best practices standpoint, then have a pen test come in and see, you know, given the unique way that your organization or your resources are deployed, are there any other gaps that come up that the pen testers can wiggle into? And then another question on zero trust. Zero trust and identity access management is huge right now. Where do you see shoring up some of the deficiencies in this area, you know, particularly around Active Directory? Um, oh yeah, that's a good question. So zero trust is, it's one of those terms I think we, we talked about earlier that but there's a lot of terms that mean a lot of different things to different people. And zero trust is, is kind of one of those things. Sometimes it's a tool, sometimes it's a process. Um, I think of zero trust more as just making sure that everything gets authenticated, right? It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, where you come from, you have to prove who you are and that you are supposed to have access, access to the, re the resource that you're accessing. Um, and so things like conditional access that give you that granular level of, of assessing, um, you know, yes, you have the secret key for application X that's coming from the internet, but are you coming from the correct IP on the internet? And so, you know, specifically within Azure, uh, Azure AD, being able to nail down through the audit logs, the things that are normal, and then locking out all the things that aren't normal, that, that becomes a huge kind of first step down that zero trust model in the cloud of just making sure that, um, that, that everything that's connecting is legitimate. Okay, great, thanks. Tell us a little bit about DevSecOps. 
Yeah, so this is the thing. It's and actually with the with the poll that we did earlier with secure software development, this is yeah. obviously a hot topic, right? And we've already kind of alluded to it in a few other things, um, especially with cloud, because that's where you're generally deploying your stuff. Um, the challenge with DevSecOps is that there's a lot of change happening, right? So the, the model is fail quickly, which is which is great for deploying features, uh, not so great for security. Um, the the couple things that come into play there. One is obviously finding those vulnerabilities that you might be introducing into your eventual deployment uh, early in the pipeline. So do you have the tools in place to do you know static code analysis or you know looking at existing vulnerabilities that may have been found in dependency packages and things like that and finding those sorts of bits ahead of time before it gets deployed to production and becomes available for everyone to attack. Uh, so that's one, one bit of it. And then the other bit of it is kind of the process, right? It's hard to pen test a process. You can pen test mm -hmm. the stuff that gets deployed in the end. You could point a team at that and say, you know, go tell me how that thing is insecure. But it's really hard to pen it's really hard to test the process leading to that point. Um, so things like, like I alluded to earlier with, with your deployment keys and how are things secured and what, what identities are able to actually create resources in your environment or destroy resources in your environment to you know, circle back to ransomware. Um, those sorts of controls and, and guardrails are important to have established before you start developing stuff, or at least you know, it, as soon into that process as possible. So when you're looking at config reviews in and around this, does it look at like what aspects of the, the process, you know? So the, yeah, at? so the, de the DevSecOps um, engagements really look at kind of that whole, those two pieces holistically. Um, it's kind of, it, I, I kind of liken it to the fact that you're kind of doing, you're building an automated pen test and config review and vulnerability scan into your deployment lifecycle. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the idea behind it. And so the, the DevSecOps engagement um, that we do really starts to focus on all of those, all of those features of how do we build this security model that we would normally do in a traditional environment where you, you, know, you do those programs, you do configure, you do pen test, you do a vulnerability scan, but now you have to do that in your deployment pipeline before you deploy to production. And this would hold true for, you know, it's not just a regular pen test, but application pen test or what we call the gray box assessment, those types of things as well. Yeah. And that would, that would kind of happen like at that source slash build phase of this, right? So if you were going to, you would have some automation in there, like I said, static code analysis, you could do some dynamic stuff. Uh, but then if you were looking to have a traditional application pen test, then you would have a build, you'd have, you know, like a UAT environment and you'd point the application test at that and say, okay, okay, team, please go check that version out and make sure that it's, um, you know, hardened. What, what challenges are, are people seeing, or have you been seeing with sort of that sprawl um, in the supply, in the software supply chain? Uh, the package, understanding your dependencies is, is I think the biggest, um, the biggest gap that most people have. Uh, so sort of that software bill of materials of do you even understand all of the things that get included in your code? And we're starting to see tools come out for that, um, which is good because that like it needs to be automated just like everything else in this pipeline. So having tools that can understand and and find where those pack, what packages you're using, what version of them, and then go look up known vulnerabilities for that stuff and, and flag that at deploy time to say, you know, here's here's something you need to be concerned about potentially. Uh, that's that's definitely the first step, uh, and most people have trouble with that, um, just because of the lack of of maturity around the whole process, but also the fact that a lot of these tools are fairly new. And IR just recently did an engagement like that, where it was a Node.js package that was actually corrupted with a um, crypto miner. So they were just doing NPM updates. It pulled the package out from the internet. That particular package was compromised and it was introduced into their network. So if, but they didn't understand that until we actually went through the process, opened up the NPM build package and saw it in there that we knew exactly what was going on. And they, they've changed their process since then, but they didn't understand it beforehand. 
yeah this, and this is not this is not like a new a new problem that um right. we haven't known about right like so, some of the some of the ones solar winds is a perfect example of of a very large scale thing where it was all based on a code pipeline getting compromised um so you can do other once you have that software code of or software bill of materials and you're you're securing that the other thing you can do is start to look for things that don't exist in that and that can become another check of you know down the line of, of you know maybe something hinky is going on in our in our pipeline here because this package that we didn't know we were using uh, all of a sudden started showing up right all right shane tell us a little bit about thread hunting there's another area that um you know, it's, it's now continuing to, you know, grow in, in popularity, um, a lot of different reasons for doing different things. Where does this fit in? And, and um, you know, where are security teams struggling, especially as you're doing the incident response, um, with kind of understanding the, the, the aspects that maybe, you know, pen test might not get to? Well, kind of like what we've alluded to already with like the pen test is, is focused on some specific aspect of, of the network or the client. And IR is kind of that way to a certain degree too. You call up and we, we follow the process to find out what's going on. But uh, there's not necessarily a holistic approach to the overall construct of, of their network infrastructure, security processes and procedures. And a lot of times what'll come back is when you talk about threat hunting, they're thinking about just find bad. And, and we're not looking at it from that point of view. We're looking at it from how do you, um, put your network and, and your infrastructure in such a place to where you can detect bad when it happens, because you'll know not only from behavioral and operational processes, what's going on, but you understand the entire infrastructure as a whole. And that's where we, we step back from it and we begin to ask them um, a series of questions and begin to build what would be their threat hunting program. Kind of like what we talked about at the very beginning of this, everybody has has a hammer, but they have a whole lot of hammers, but they, they actually need a set of tools. Mm -hmm. So uh, a current engagement that we were just working on, they had Carbon Black, Splunk, Cisco, Tanium, um, Microsoft Defender. They have all of these tools that they have purchased or that they have. But then when you ask them a simple question like, how would you be able to detect if you had a threat actor on one of your endpoints, they, they first they panicked and then they go well i'm not really sure and then they go well maybe we'll go to this and then the, another person comes on and says no you can't use that that tool doesn't actually look at the endpoint this tool does and what we get to at, at a point there is you the the analysts who are in these organizations become overwhelmed with tools threat fatigue alerts and all these type of things what we tend to want to come in and from that and kind of holistically look at everything and put them in a context going, this is how you would do this and how you would build this and build your infrastructure pieces in such a place that you can actually not only do the threat hunting, but you can map that out to th say things like the threat miter attack framework. You can, uh, you can say, I have gaps in here. Let me test, let me, let me schedule a pen test. Let me schedule a tabletop. Let me do something in order to be able to put all those pieces together so that you can find all the gaps in your organization. I mean, I would hazard a guess if I were to at, you know, walk into any organization right now and I said, out of your subnets, do you know how much of your subnet infrastructure is dark, meaning there's not supposed to be anything there? And then have them ping it and see if actually something's there. They don't know what they have. They don't have what they know. So that's kind of where we're trying to get them to that point and mature them beyond the what we keep talking about earlier about configuration problems and patching and all the pieces that need to go into place so that you have a process and procedure by which to do that. How do you know when to really do a threat hunt? You know, and, and, and obviously a pen test, it's uh, it's mandated in, in many regards. But, you know, how, how does an organization say, OK, we did pen test, but you know, yes, we should do a threat hunt and yes, we should, you know, really improve or, or have a, uh, a threat program. From IR's point of view, it, it'll, it, a lot of times it'll come up as a recommendation, especially if it's, we're working in engagement and we start to see um, things operationally that materialize that shouldn't have been there. A um, uh, classic example is, um, we like to, to reference jump boxes as a way of 
separating the core infrastructure from the administra administrators and users. If they don't have something like that, it means that operationally they haven't matured to that level. And then maybe we'll find other things. How are they managing passwords? Are they managing accounts? They have MFA. All these things start to bubble up and we, where you say, uh, out of 10 things that I was looking for, I found nine of them. You probably should be looking at maturing your model and, and this might be a way to do that. Shane, is, is this is a threat hunt and kind of the, the outcome of what your, what the IR team is doing with these threat hunt engagements is, is kind of the outcome potentially to look at making sure that for your next pen test, you're in a better position to detect that activity. Is that something that the, makes sense? That's part of it. The other part of it is, is to mature them in such a way that they can either detect threats or that they have a, a consistent, mature way to actually look and, and address their network infrastructure. Mm. Um, it, I know we're going to talk about patching here in a minute. And I was going to put it in there as part of that. But just look at, at uh, last year's proxy shell. Proxy shell was a vulnerability that was on MSN exchange servers that when the, when the thing was released, um, through Black Hat, DEF CON, the patches were already available. Yet for months, we were still getting IR calls about it mm -hmm. um, where there was compromises in place. This means to me that your operational just patch management isn't mature enough to be able to handle that. And these weren't mom and pop shops. They were pretty decent sized organizations. And that's where I was getting to. Yeah, okay. And then how much, you know, are, are you seeing or hearing of organizations actually using threat intelligence or counter threat intelligence, uh, you know, dark web uh, information in what they're doing in, in threat hunting or, you know, perhaps guiding a pen test, you know, what have you? Uh, from the IR point of view, we, we see some of it. Um, they tend to, uh, what we see is they're subscribed to threat intelligence feeds uh, and they're using that as a catalyst for, to go look for stuff. Uh, one thing about that is it it works to a certain degree, but the you know threat intelligence is an effervescent kind of thing. It's good for a little while, and then it kind of kind of it goes off to something else. Especially things that are like I like uh, IP addresses and domains. Those things aren't going to stay there very long. You, you need to be looking for what the behavioral mechanisms are because the actor is going to change their IP address or whatnot, but their behaviors are going to relatively be the same. And that's what you're going to be wanting to look for. But yes, they do use uh, threatened or intelligence that comes from other sources and some dark web stuff. Um, we tend to, I don't see that quite as much, but it is there. Great. Tell us a little bit about uh, tabletop exercises, where they're, you know, sort of fitting in. Um, and again, you know, from a pen test perspective, are you be able to use any of that? And what are some of the, you know, pros and cons of, of, of both with executives? Okay, I'll start with that. Um, so tabletop exercises cover a wide variety of, of areas. Most of them do tend to be on the technical side because we're looking for gaps, uh, again, in operation uh, features. And it, use ransomware as an example. We use that one quite often because it's a hot topic going, how would you handle an actual incident as it goes, goes beyond, goes through its process. But uh, on that same token, we also have the executive side of that. And the executive side asks those generalized questions that might not have come up before. Do you pay a ransom? What, what, what would happen if you do? Are you able to? What is, uh, would there be sanctions if you were to do that? Do you have to, um, do you have to do any disclosures or any kind of, uh, of uh, media output to do that? What would happen if you tried to keep it hush and the media got a hold of it? What happens if um, your information is disclosed anyway or um, double, uh, double extortion technique where they will go ahead and, and publish the data anyway? Uh, what happens if they contact your clients? How are you going to be able to do all those? Uh, how are you going to be able to present yourself as we have a secure network and you can still do business with us? Those are the questions that aren't necessarily technical in nature. They have to be answered at a, at a broader uh, group that includes legal, uh, corporate communication, executives, um, both from the financial side of it and from the business uh, direction point of view. And when these questions are posed to them, in, in many cases, they, they may have parts of it. It may fit somewhat in their disaster recovery kind of plans and things like that, but they're not always sure 
um, how they're going to address that. And this where the tabletop kind of exercises that so they can they can find those holes and put them in place. And so, so are you getting into like very specifics um, when, when you get into these or, or what are some of the executives, you know, saying and around it? Are they, you know, have you seen changes in programs? You know, I guess that would, you know, go for any, any, any one of the panelists, but are you seeing changes in the programs, true changes in the programs as it comes as a result of these? Well, from the IR point of view, because we deliver them, the tabletops are directed so that they already know what the scenario is. So it's it's not like we're just going to throw it to them at random. It's uh, it's already been discussed that this is what we're going to be talking about, and then we pose the questions. Um, uh, on some of them, they do make some significant changes as far as how that's going to go. Um, as one of the areas that we see most common from the IR point of view after we deliver it is their um, corporate communication and and how they're going to address those issues going outside of the company itself. Um, how, how would they talk to the media? How would they talk to their third party business partners? And if it's a publicly traded company, how they might be able to position themselves if it were to leak out in that or, or get out in one form or another to protect the, the stock price and or, or the interests of the company and companies that they own. Phil or Alex, anything you've seen from tabletops? Um... You know, from, from that regard and, you know, the changes that are coming from them. Absolutely. And, and you know, what I've been privileged to kind of go along with the IRR team and um, be part of a tabletop. I think one of the things that, that really comes out of it is kind of awareness across the organization. Um, you know, it, it's oftentimes when you talk to, you know, the technical staff, you know, somewhere, they have a pretty good idea of what they would do in, in an incident, even if it's not well documented. But one of the biggest challenges is that there are so many roles outside of just IT or, or information security that really come into play, um, you know, during an incident and then, and then the, the aftermath. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we kind of consistently see as a theme is that a lot of execs are not aware that they have a role. Um, in fact, to be honest with you, one of the things that oftentimes comes out of the, the first tabletop is, is people actually becoming aware that they have a role in an incident. And when you think about all the legal repercussions and the, you know, the um, you know, external communication, internal communication, et cetera, you can start to understand why you know, these things are so important. Um, another thing is, uh, I remember I had a professor years ago that always said that you know, everybody always knows the entire story about everything. It's just, if they don't get the accurate information, they kind of make up in their mind what happened, right? And so when there's a lot of, um, information kind of flying around during an incident um, at an organization. It's just very important um, that the messaging, not just externally, but internally is appropriate. So people kind of understand, you know, what's happening and what they can and can't say and, and what they need to do. So certainly as a result of these things, you know, we've seen um, a lot of people at organizations really start to understand a little bit more about their role in these. Awesome. Great. Shame. Tell us about the incident response readiness then, you know, as again, from a from a pen test perspective, as we, you know, typically start with that. And, and it does, you know, give us some sort of insights into, you know, what to do. But but tactically, you know, what types of things are you looking at and, and how are you kind of walking through, um, you know, very specifically where organizations you know, currently stand? That comes in in a couple different ways. The first one we've already kind of talked about it about the threat hunt or threat assessment side of it. The other uh, half of that comes a lot of times as the postmortem of an IR engagement, where um, we have delivered what had happened, the report and, and all the pieces that are there. And now we're sitting down not only with the technical team, but sometimes even with the executive staff and saying, this is the overall issue that you that you had. This might be, these are the recommendations that we would put forth that you would, in order to be able to make yourself more, uh, have a better security posture. And here are the things that we would expect um, in, the, in the short term and even in the long term, because not some, some of the things that we uncover are not something you can just flip the switch and, and it's, it's done and it'll be done in the next week or so. It becomes a, a project uh, over a long period of time. Um, uh, a classic example of that might be something like the the, the password policy, if it because we'll see that the, an attacker might have might have pushed out all the passwords, and we can see them all, 
And we're like, okay, you did you have MFA? No, they don't have MFA. Uh, your passwords are relatively weak, so you're going to have user awareness training that you're going to want to do. You want to get them the password, and then you want to get them on MFA so that they have multi-factor. That's that's a project. That's not something you just turn on in the next couple of days. That's that's just one example of those type of things that would come as a post-mortem uh, for organizations to be able to put themselves in a better security posture than they were when we started. Alex, from you know, from a you know, a higher level, you know, when you're reviewing just an, an incident response program, or we needed you know IR program versus you know do we are we tactically able? What what types of things go into that? Just you know, kind of how is it different from you know what's the high level stuff versus you know getting into the the very you know tactical and technical? I think the key word is oper operationalize, um, and, and that's something that we hear uh, quite often. I'm also impressed I was able to say that word the first time. <laughs> that's a first. But, you know, certainly it, it's sometimes you see that, you know, plans that are, um, you know, pretty heavy and things that may be dusted off in, in certain situations. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we oftentimes will see organizations looking for is kind of having multiple levels of, uh, you know, an IR program so that, you know, there's a kind of a general policy and, um, and then kind of a day-to-day -day guide that, you know, you would use for the most common types of incidents and, you know, depending on how you're defining incident. Um, and then kind of that next level of, you know, what to do when, um, you know, obviously there's a, a pretty significant issue and you need to kind of really dig into these systems. Um, but, you know, for us, it's, um, you know, I think communication is just so important. Um, and that's one of the things that oftentimes you see lacking a bit um, is organizations haven't necessarily thought about, um, you know, how they're going to manage communications in the event their systems are unavailable, right? Um, you know, we've had yet a number of times, you know, even recently um, where that's been an issue where the, you know, the plan was uh, devised and developed to use certain, um, you know, methods of communication that became unavailable as a result of the incident. Um, so it, it really is interesting to see uh, organizations that are really just at different places on their journey towards um, incident response maturity. And, you know, the ones that, that really kind of have every single thing laid out and others that, you know, have that much more general approach. And this goes back into the tabletop type stuff. This is what some of the things that are flushed out. Um, we recently did uh, a tabletop exercise where it was a ransomware type of activity. And it, it, uh, they said that they would convene in the office in order to be able to do that type of stuff. And I said, well, what how do you get to the office? And they explained the process. And I said, well, what happens if your card and badge reader was part of the encrypted services and it's no longer available? Are you able to get into your building? Fortunately, they did have physical keys and they were being able to get to there. But in other cases, the badge reader, if it were offline, they're not getting into their building or at least not easily. So those are the type of things that you're saying where it, it gets you ready by going through the process of how would you handle this? How would you do this? All right, excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, if anyone has any uh, last questions and we we're asking along the way, but if anyone has, has any last questions, feel free to shoot them across. And then as we uh, up against it and, fi and finishing up here, you know, this get a little help call us, it's free. I anyone and maybe Alex, what, you know, what types of things should people be calling you about or asking, you know, in addition, um, you know, and it could be with cost or, you know, just what, what to use. You know what 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 types of things have you been seeing? You know, are people asking you what types of you know areas would you really you know recommend that they reach out to you for? So we're really always happy to talk to people about um, their information security program. Uh, you know, there are times that you know we might not be the best fit. Um, you know, we hope we are, but we're still happy to talk to people's compliance requirements or testing needs or you know really you know questions um, that they may have. You know, I always say that, um, you know, I'm certainly not smarter than anybody else, but I've just seen so many environments and that really rings true, um, you know, throughout our organization is that the people here have, you know, just been out and, and seen so many different ways of doing things and kind of what works and what doesn't and can see multiple uh, perspectives on issues. So, so really, we're always, you know, happy to talk through these things, um, you know, happy to, to have a call anytime. Okay, great. 
Well, thanks everyone uh, for joining today. Really appreciate your time and really appreciate uh, the three of you uh, putting your time in today for us, giving us a little insight in some of the other things and some that uh, that you work on and, and areas that you're helping the or different organizations with. So thanks again for everyone joining today and look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.